Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Daniel Levin, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Achlin with Sachlin. Hey, so you've got this incredible book, which I had in front of me a second ago, but here it is. I'm listening to it on my uh, on my phone right now at the moment. I got it on the audiobook style. It's called Proof of Life. And what makes this book incredible for everybody listening is um, uh, Dan lived out a thriller movie, and then, but it was real. And then he wrote about it in your book. Dude, I mean, I, I'm a counterintelligence agent. I've worked overseas a lot. And so much of what you've done, the um, maybe we approach the problem differently, but so much of what you talk about in the book has really impacted me because um, you're right on the thing. And it, it, what's crazy is as I'm listening and reading to the book, I'm thinking, this is a movie. This isn't real life, but it was real life. Can you even believe you did this thing and, and survived it? You know, the, the strange thing about it is, I mean, this all this took place in 2014. And while I was experiencing it, it didn't feel like this was a movie script. Then when I wrote it down and I had some people read the manuscript and I got reactions where the people started to be incredulous, say, man, this reads like a movie script. And uh, it, it really when you're in the midst of it all, I mean, I do diaries. I've been writing diaries for for over 45 years. And so. Uh, you start, you chronicle your days. You don't really see it that way You're in the midst of it all. Once you take a step back, you write down the book or you read the book, and then you start to realize, wow, this has a completely different feel to it. Yeah. And that, um, that realization that you get, it does come later. I, I, there are so many times when I tell someone a story and I see the expression on their face change and I go, oh my gosh, this firefight that I was in is one of my favorite stories about like, I'm in this firefight. Um, but in the meantime, I have to talk to someone. So I'm talking to someone and there are bullets uh, splashing on the building that we're like in an alleyway sort of, right? And we're totally safe. Nothing's going to hit us or anything. But there are bullets impacting the building that we're on as people are fighting things. Up. They're not fighting us. They're, they're fighting someone else. And if it turns and changes, we can, we can egress out a different way. And when I tell that story to people and say, yeah, there's an active gunfight. I don't know, 10, 15 bullets. And then like the cement chips would hit us and everything. But again, totally fine. And I had work to do. And so we were having this conversation. You know, I know you can appreciate this. And you write about it and you're like, oh, my God, that's not at all normal. You know, but in this situation, totally normal. Yeah, I think, you know, I think anyone who's also experienced combat, I mean, there are all kinds of high pressure situations in life. But I think for you and me, having experienced combat uh, for me in my youth, I, uh, it, it kind of puts you in a different mindset. So. I really didn't experience anything cinematic or unusual about it while I'm in the midst of it because I'm really fighting day by day, layer by layer, uh, trying to meet essentially the next crazy person and to get me to the source of the information I'm looking for. Uh, so I'm just, ex I'm really stuck in that moment every single time. I don't get the full narrative of the arc of the trajectory of the story until I sit back and reflect back and start writing it down and say, wow, that's, that was actually some pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, this is an important thing you're talking about. When I'm going out day by day, and it's just so you know, I was a I was a spy, right? And so my job was to go off the camp. And sometimes I'm with the army. Sometimes I can't be with the army. But I'm slowly gathering puzzle pieces. And, and there are so many times in the book where you take an action and it actually unlocks for you a piece of the puzzle later on. You know, whether you're, you know, standing up for someone who needs standing up for whatever it is. And so... I know I become aware, like what I do at any given moment may matter. I need to act genuine how I'd normally act. But um, and it's one of the reasons why I don't I don't typically focus on any kind of, of deception or control of the conversation, because I'm trying to figure out how to interact in their world. And I, I know you're trying to sort these things out. And there are so many unknown unknowns. You can put a lot of extra work on yourself to try to master your environment when you really are kind of, I think at least you end up kind of being along for the ride. Yeah. I mean, th this is really critical. It's very funny getting reactions from people who, especially, you know, there were actually film rights were sold for this manuscript and 
it's really interesting in the in the auction process getting all kinds of uh, expressions of interest that wanted to turn this into kind of a Jason Bourne kind of you know, Jack Reacher type of caricature. And I kept saying, you're really missing the point. It's not so much that I don't have superpowers and don't paraglide into, you know, a prison or something, obviously. But it's also that the, all those narratives are about the main protagonist. Whereas for me, I am a much more, uh, I'm more of a bystander and not less of an actor. And the more authentically I can sort of just meld, uh, you know, just, just mix into the context, you know, be part of a conversation, not stand out through my accent or through my skin color or through the way I dress or through the way I eat. The less I stand out, the more successful I'm going to be. So the more I'm effacing myself in all those moments, the more, the more mm -hmm. successful. So there's this real gap and it's not so much that I, you know, that I don't jump out of airplanes without parachutes. That's just silly. But in terms of even just not making yourself the story in order to be successful in this kind of a, activity you really have to avoid making yourself the story once you made yourself the story you're done yeah. you're done you first of all you might be in danger but second of all you're certainly not going to advance any further on these kinds of peeling away the layers of the onion yeah i mean we're definitely approaching this problem from the same di same direction i mean I, the thing i had as i got better and better at this because i stayed right and i continued to work at the ground level as i realized how how damaging my own ego was my job was to build trust. And if I could build trust, then, and, and I had to graduate, like I can extend trust because I'm an American. So here's some low risk trust. Can we meet again? Yes, we can. And we did. Okay, great. There's a proven trust. And then you can escalate it up to the point where, and I know you'll identify with this, um, when someone's, and I'll say to someone, I'll have the respect, and this is not at all army style, like this is completely out of the norm. I'll say to the Iraqi, the Afghan, the, the person from whatever country I'm in, and I'll say to them, hey, uh, your time's important to me, and so is your safety and security. I'd love to meet with you. How should we do that? When, where, whatever. And they're like, how about I come get you and just take you to my house? Now, you to anybody else, that sounds crazy. To you, you know, we have to do this at some point because I have to allow that person to be the, the shake that they are, to, to be the host that they are, to be better at security than I can be. And I have to allow that, but that means I have to surrender all of my things. It doesn't mean I willy nilly go make bad decisions and put myself in dangerous situations, but I put myself in a dangerous situations by design because I'm a, I have a trusted and established uh, trust with the person that I'm working with. Yeah. I, I mean, it goes down to really uh, very sensitive cultural differences between places. So even if you're accustomed to working in Arab countries, the way you interact with people, the way you greet, the kind of deference to age is very different, let's say, in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, than it's going to be in the Gulf, mm -hmm. in a Bedouin society. And you really have to pick up on those nuances. If you want to engage with someone at their level, it's not just about the fact that you can say hello in Arabic. It's also about even the small accents and right and whether... Uh, you're taking from a plate serving the elder first or whether you're kissing them on the nose or on the forehead to greet them, right? Totally different if you're in Yemen or if you're in Qatar and Abu Dhabi, let alone if you're in, in the outskirts of Beirut or in Aleppo. And so, uh, you know, those are the small nuances and it's the ability to appreciate them that is ultimately your biggest sign of respect for the person mm -hmm. you're talking to. And it's very disarming in that sense without being sycophantic, without being submissive. It's just that I'm in your place. I'm going to play this on your terms and I'm going to show that respect. Now, at the end, down the road, there may be something I'll want, but not before we've established a relationship. And that may take years at times, right? So the other thing that you learn is you can't start to act that role just because yeah. you need something. These are lines that you have to establish way, way, way in advance. And one day you may need them. One day you'll never need them. One day it might be a favor you do for a third party in return for a fourth party to do something for you. But that kind of a web, you can't spin that in the moment that you need it. You really have to lay those foundations years in advance. Some of this stuff you learn by simply being humble. And, and even if you think you know it, and, and you might know it, um, I've always found, and I would tell my interpreters, I worked with an interpreter primarily because my Arabic was, it wasn't as good as, as it need, could be. you know. But um, I would say to my interpreter, I'm going to ask questions that you know I know the answer to. But I want to get their answer to this very specific question because I want to allow them to teach me. And every time you hear the answer, like the Iraqis would tell me all the time, listen, we're not religious. We're not religious. At all. I mean, before you guys got here, we just didn't care. And then and to, this, to this point, this colonel, and I knew this was a theme, right? And so I would use this to my advantage. So I would ask this person this question. 
my interpreter would be like, yeah, but you know they're not real. I'm like, just ask the question. And then this colonel that I was, I was talking to is, pulls out a whiskey bottle during Ramadan. And it's like, Let, let's have some drinks. If I knew everything, every time I was in every meeting, I could never get to that whiskey bottle, which I found the whiskey bottle is very powerful. It's like a, it's an extension of trust back to me. It's like, hey, I'm going to tell you something. That I'm not, not, you know, I keep this thing in my drawer. Probably everybody knows, but it, you know, it it opens the thing to to get to the conversation to maybe get that puzzle piece, or at least be in the courtyard where the puzzle piece may be someday. Right, and it's also the patience to wait for them to tell you about the whiskey bottle. So I'm I'm in countless situations where someone else may tell me, "Listen, Shake So and So actually really loves, uh, you know, single malt." Right. And uh, and so I think the mistake most people make is to say, oh, that's an icebreaker. I say, well, I like single malt. Do you like Macallan? I like Macallan, too. And so they bring it up. And the, the mistake that they just made is that they didn't wait for them to give you that information and create that kind of trust. Right. So in other words, be patient and allow for them to trust you enough to share that with you. And then you can start to talk about commonality. So there's always a tendency to want to show off. Right. So even mm-hmm. when we say yep. we're going to efface our own ego. We really want to know. We want to know that they know how well we speak Arabic or how well we know how to order the right dishes or the fact that you can't eat labne with fish and why you can't eat labne with fish and stuff like that, right? And the answer is no need to do that. You're in this room because you passed a few thresholds. Let it flow to you. And if you need to self-efface a little bit longer, that's okay. And then, you know, those are nuances that serve you well, but you you, you have to know how to do that with home. It's, it, again, totally different thing. I can be sitting, you know, in, in Buremi, in, in, in uh, Oman, or across the border from Alain, and have a conversation with a tribal leader there that's completely different than sitting in Riyadh in the palace, right? So totally different settings and different contexts. And but that requires some time and nuance and patience. And then the other thing is, of course, to understand that time itself has a completely different meaning. So you're in this frantic schedule. You're trying to find information about a person who went missing. You know that every day can be critical. But you can't put a gun to anyone's head because you just don't have that kind of leverage. You just yeah. don't. And you have to understand, I'm going into those spaces without power and without leverage. Whatever I can get is because I've established a relationship. And as a result of that relationship can advance. That's all. I have absolutely no, nothing to squeeze anybody with. And that's, uh, you know, it's in a way liberating. But of course, it can also be frustrating. I've also found that I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, time really belongs to them. You know, like you can nudge things along. You're nudging things along by design, not by desire. And so I'll give an example. And this is, again, for the audience so that they can understand. But um, me and this Army guy that I'm working with, the Army guy's junior, and he's trying to get something done because his commander wants it done. When we go in and it's like the evening time. And we're so bad in the States at understanding culture. We fear culture. We don't want to offend somebody. But the reality is, is if you just allow it to like, if you can understand that it's different and then allow it to be different until you can get up to speed with their culture, you'll do a lot better. So we walk into this room and there's a bunch of army, Iraqi army guys, and they're watching TV and this lieutenant's like barking, hey, 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 you know, trying to get that. And I'm like, dude, they're all watching soccer. Let's ask a simple question. Why are y'all watching soccer? And they're like, oh, it's the Arab cup. And I'm like, ah. And I look at the LT and I'm like, we're not working right now. Our work is right here and watching Arab Cup with these guys. And he it broke his brain to not do his job. And I'm like, you're doing your job right now. You're partnering at a level that you're not, you haven't even been trained. Like, just sit here and watch this game. Same thing with the food thing. Um, I typically eat left-handed. And so I would say to them, like, I eat left-handed. What, what does that mean to you guys? And I'm like, look, you're an American. You're not Islamic. It's fine. You can eat left-handed. We don't care. We know you're not from here. You don't, and so that taught me you can't out Iraq and Iraqi. You can't out Jordan or Jordanian. You know you just can't do it. And so don't try to do it. Be yourself. Be respectful, but be yourself. You know, uh, in your book you talk about um, the experience when one of the players says, "Hey, uh, you got to watch how you sit because if you point your feet towards someone, they'll take offense." And that's something that you can even make that offense and recover from it because you are different. But you have to know that that's like that how to correct that offense. Right. And then there there are fine nuances. There are going to be situations where if you try too hard to adjust, you're being too submissive. Right. So there comes a moment where you have to be respectful. But you can also. So, for example, 
there are certainly moments where I strategically choose not to speak in Arabic. Uh, right. and, and, and sometimes I even strategically choose not to speak in English. I know that someone speaks broken French and I'll just choose French because it gives me a strategic advantage without being rude. So in other words, they have an option of bringing a translator if they want it. So, uh, you know, it's not always just about uh, adjusting and making sure that everyone knows how sensitive to a culture, but you have to make a conscious choice and read the room properly also, not just barge in and just kind of say, okay, here I am, this is what I need. It doesn't work that way. Something may well be transactional. In other words, it's still going to be quid pro quo, whether it's directly with you or through usually more likely through other parties to get information, to get a hostage, to get to negotiate a price, whatever the case may be. But it does not mean just because it's transactional that you don't have to, first of all, establish a relationship. And if you want to be really crude in the way you look at it, the more you've established a relationship, the, the lower the price gets for what you're trying to get. Essentially, One of the things that uh, I think it's, we often lose sight of because we are too ego focused is that the things we say are repeated outside of that room to other people. You know, they talk about us. Right. right. And so like uh, one of the things that got out in my region where I was at was that you know, I, I was uncomfortable for me to sit on the floor because my body just doesn't work right. You know, motorcycle accidents, and lots of arming. And so I would always just ask for a chair. And I'm like, I don't take offense, but my body just doesn't work right. And so then the next thing you know, and this is this is the Arab culture to a T. Every time I showed up to a meeting, no look, no spoken word, no nothing. And all of a sudden, a chair would show up because they knew Abu Brenna needed a chair. And right. so like the sheikh wouldn't have to even say it. His son would just be like, and he would just... You know, and there's like, uh, there's just a magic to that. And, and, and it taught me like, hey, don't forget these guys all know each other. And they're going to say, hey, the Americans came by the other day. And so what you do is I, I chose to never lie. Like, okay, I mean, sometimes you don't have to tell the whole truth. But I chose to be honest as a default so that my own previous self didn't undermine my future self. Right. Right. Yeah, you definitely have to. First of all, it's a better way to go through life any which way. And I think that people have a much more keen radar for people who are inauthentic than we assume for some reason we have this bizarre thing baked into our ego where we think we're the only ones who can detect a lie or an inauthentic person everyone around us does have that too and then you're also in a culture you know i'm, I'm sort of descending whether it is beirut or dubai or saudi arabia wherever it is and you know i'm descending into a culture especially in the gulf where uh, for the last 50 60 years locals have been accustomed to being flattered and trying to be used or taken advantage of because they're just perceived as being immensely wealthy. Yeah. And so their radars for fake, you know, friendship and saccharine kind of, you know, niceties are, is highly sensitive. So, uh, you know, there are many, many people I know that I, I've known for 15, 20 years before we even advance to the next level, before I've set foot into their house, I might make it, you know, to the majlis on the outside of the house in the courtyard. But before I've even made it into a home, uh, you know, I go through years, sometimes decades of time to do that. And, and you sort of and the, the when you're admitted in is when it's perceived as being authentic. And they don't really care how well how good your Arabic is at that moment. It's really more about whether your relationship is authentic, meaning there's a friendship there that goes beyond just wanting something from someone. And that's a fine line. There are even in the work that I do, there are moments where I choose not to go at a person for information or for help because it would completely demolish that relationship that I have, you know, and, and you just have to leave it on the side and say, that's not this, this is, I'm not going to mix those things up. One of the things too, is we often think that money is the answer to every problem. And, and, uh, this is a rule that I developed that, um, when you go to a place like Syria, where a lot of this book is, is, is focused, um, we, are good at stability. We are not good at instability. We're certainly not better than Syrians or Kurds at living in an unstable place. They are excellent at it. And part of that is because they've learned to, you know, they don't, like I was always told, you Americans trust too easily, you know? And there's all this deceit that has to happen to accomplish the goal. And that's the best way I can explain it because it's not deceit. It's just like this pro forma way of getting things done. It's never direct. It's always through the side door and you can't always be up front. And Americans were always so up front and, and dealing with these things. So one of the things I found out is that you say, what is, what, you know, what is the least thing, like the smallest thing that we could just do right now 
that would improve your life, your village, whatever it is? Like, what's something that we should just be able to right now do? And they would say the most simple, mundane things. Like, if we could just flatten that piece of road over there where the ruts are, because it tears our cars apart. And then now you're working on something that you really could, in theory, just grab some shovels and just start smashing down dirt. But you have something that's tangible. And they're not asking for a million dollars. They're asking for help in a very specific and practical way. Yeah, I mean, in the army, in my army days, we'd go into a village and it'd be, again, what, you know, how do we bridge this? How do we create relationships? Sometimes it'd be toothpaste. I mean, stuff like that, yeah. you know, where it's like, hey, no problem. Problem solved, you know. We can get you something from those supplies. But yeah, I think that the hardest thing in, in the work, is specifically when hostages are involved for me, is that you do have a clock ticking. And yeah. so you have, on the one hand, this, this absolute existential need to be patient and roll along with the relationships and the conversations and layer after layer after layer. And at the same time, you know that time is not your friend and that the chances of getting some, you know, information, let alone getting someone alive, at some point just go down exponentially, right? So there's kind of a cliff. Uh, and so that's really hard is to go through those relationships, go through those motions. And so... One way to solve that is to not be the one who communicates the sense of urgency, right? So in mm -hmm. other words, you still have trusted relationships that are local, that are able to communicate to the local sheikh, let's say, look, Daniel is trying to be respectful and he obviously is going to adjust entirely to your pacing, but I know and not from him and he hasn't asked me to say this, but, um, you, you know, he's going to be here for the relationship and he's going to be coming back and he'll be in our lives for a while. But in the meantime, I think we're all benefiting if we can help or save this person, whatever the case may be. So sometimes it's really have it's not really a good cop, bad cop thing. But if you do have a, a clock ticking and, a, and an urgency that you can't just change, you need to do this with multiple people so someone else can deliver. But that, again, requires a pre-existing relationship of trust. Otherwise, you're done. And also, again, like smashing that ego back into its cage, you know, right. so that you're not just making it about you. And what you're really talking about, at least from my point of view, is, is how you use an interpreter. An interpreter doesn't have to interpret the language only. You know, there's certain things where I will pre-brief my interpreter because I want like they're part of me and they're going to be part of them. So I need them to understand like what I'm trying to accomplish. And they'll say, this isn't how we approach this. Let me let me handle this for you because they know the culture better than I ever will. And then they're able to massage us from, you know, and I just have to kind of, I always liken it to I'm riding a wild horse and I just let my hands off, go off the reins. And I know that I'm going to get there, but the less in control I am to get, if they've got a better path, it gets me to, to, to where I need to be and faster and more efficiently, then I want to use that path. But it is terrifying until you get used to the fact that you also have to trust this other person, this agent, and, and they, they can bring you what you need. But you're, you're just going to have to <laughs> like put a lot of trust into that relationship. Yeah, interpreters, I have an interesting relationship with interpreters. So obviously, if I'm in a country, if I'm in China or Russia, and I just don't you know, speak, any, speak a language or speak it well enough to really conduct a conversation, I just need an interpreter. But if I am in a country where I actually speak the language, I will often still have an interpreter or a friend who will interpret. <laughs> And I'll do it for two reasons, two main reasons. One is the, the one that should be obvious to anyone, which is an interpreter buys you more time to think. And, and I don't know why this isn't more obvious to more people, but just, we, you know, we make so many terrible mistakes when our mouths are just a little bit faster than our minds. So th this extra time is invaluable. That's number one. And then the second reason, which is no less important, is uh, an interpreter in a situation can often reveal the truth in the sense that the person I'm actually talking to sometimes feels much more comfortable talking to an interpreter. Even if it was my interpreter, for some reason, that consciousness is switched off and they think they can, they kind of have an ally in the interpreter and they can express themselves. They will say, well, tell so-and-so there's no way I'm going to do that unless, and then they say, but that's not what I want you to tell him. I'm hearing the whole conversation, understanding it. And I have to then say, remind myself, I can't react to what he just said. I can't move my face. I can just sit there. I can smile. And then the interpreter turns around and looks at me and says, this is the way we need to do it. And he leaves away all the other stuff. And then you again, have to check your ego. None of those stupid jokes, like really? Because it sounded like he said a whole lot more than what you just said and all that. Forget all that. Play along with it. It buys so much. It, it really enables... It gives you so many more tools and just so many more weapons to solve this. Um, 
so so I very, very often go into these meetings with interpreters, even when I've, afterwards in dinner, we can have a direct conversation in Arabic on any other language. Right. No, it's so true. And, and it's a thing. It's a shame that the, the military, when we would go places, that we don't take that seriously. Most of the interpreter training is focused on mistrust. And you're always testing. Like this person oftentimes is an American or a legal alien of America who's older than the person they're working with, you know, and you're like, we have to at some point. Right. And that time, that time is invaluable because I found that my, my first instinct for the question is not the best question. And then, um, and I think this will make sense to you. I'm listening for things, not to you. Yes, I, I hear everything you're saying, but I'm listening for the lever that I want to pull or the lever I want to push because what my ego wants me to ask is often not the right question. And sometimes I'm just going to stay on, on, on path and I'm going to use those first questions. But sometimes there's a more subtle way and even just like a, a level one word question or silence or a nod, you know, where the person just continues past where they normally would have talked. And then they get into a new zone. One of my favorite questions, and this is how they say it in, in Iraqi Arabic. So I don't know how they say it exactly. Yeah, maybe it's Hunu, right? But Shunu Rayak, what's your opinion on this? You know, and then you ask someone who has an opinion, you ask them their opinion as an American. I found that they're just like, wow, you actually care what I think? And I'm like, of course, Habibi. I, I, I'm, I'm desperate to know. I know what I think. I want to know what you think. And it's hard to get people to shut up once you ask them for their input. And you've got to deal with what comes out of their mouth. But the reality is, is you can get a lot of understanding of people when you ask that question. Right. And, and you need to, you know, there's subtleties to it. So even if you're at, if you want something from someone, if you're in the Gulf, a person of authority, they can say, yeah, I'm going to do it. And they can say whatever, you know, with God's help, whatever the words may be. Right. Um, but inshallah and this and whatever the, the context may be. But in the Gulf, if you hear the word tum, it just means done. Mm -hmm. Like, Nothing is going to break this bond. It is more valuable than inshallah. It's no bad, no bisharafi, no none of that. It's going to be tum means this deal is closed. Mm -hmm. And so an interpreter is not going to translate that that way. But if you're picking up on those nuances, it really gives you that time. The other thing with interpreter that's really helpful, I think that um, negotiators in any context, military intelligence, civilian intelligence, hostage negotiations, again, F FBI, military, whatever the context may be. I think we're often wrongly taught to sort of look at body language and see what do you think of body language and how's the person sitting? Is he look, does he look comfortable, not comfortable? And having an interpreter actually gives you more of an opportunity to see a change in body language. So it's really more about understanding a person's baseline and see how it changes than just looking something like a snapshot and thinking you can read something out of that. So having, you know, having a little bit more of a stretch, it's a dynamic stretch in that sense is just really valuable. So right. You know, it's it's something I really don't surrender. In fact, I often have situations where I'm in meetings, the interpreter's there, and then afterwards we go and break bread. No more interpreter. I'm just having direct conversations. And I realize how many more mistakes I make mm -hmm. because I don't have that buffer to observe, that buffer to think, that buffer to listen, right? And then my ego trips me up, right? That's when, yeah. <laughs> God, I talk a little bit too much and it's a little bit too much about myself and I'm dominated too much airtime. And then I reflect back and said, man, I spoke 70% of the time, right? So- and in, so it, it's really slowing yourself down. It's also what behavioral psychologists like Danny Kahneman talks about system one, system two. Having an interpreter allows you to delay that gut moment. Yep. So in other words, use your head a little bit more. We all have prejudices and gut, but it del delays that moment for you. And it's, it's really valuable and it's certainly valuable when you're negotiating for someone else's life. When I use body language, and I'm pretty good at it, and sometimes the truth will be screamed at me in body language, and I, I'm thankful for those times because it's easier, right? But a lot of times, I'm just using it as a tool. Like if I see hands above the heart, I know that they're excited. If their feet come off the floor, they're like, okay, this person's excited. What, how, do I, how do I use this? Or, mm -hmm. you know, what does that mean? Why do, you know, and you start thinking through, and you need those extra seconds that the interpreter gives you to go, Wow, this guy's really fired up. Maybe now is the time to ask him for that thing that I want because they are fired up, you know, and right. whatever it is. That's sort of what I, and I also use it as like a, a test. Like, okay, I believe this person, I don't focus so much on deception. I know there's deception going on all the time. I mean, it's just how it works in that part of the world. They're not being completely honest. So I don't, I, I kind of reject those things, but I'm looking for a pattern. Like, can I reliably predict if this person is going to get excited by this or uh, down or whatever it is. And I try to, I try to use it as a cue 
to how I should ask this next question or make this next statement. Does that resonate at all? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that I, I'm always, you know, I write this in the book at this mentor uh, who passed away uh, five, six years ago. I was extremely keen of a gentleman who was in his late eighties. He always said one thing, which is he didn't invent this. And he always said, you know, if you're looking or playing poker, looking around the room and you can't figure out who the sucker is, chances are it's you. Right. And so, for me, the deception thing, I'm extremely careful with that. First of all, I'm already in an environment that's not my home environment. I'm an environment where I'm trying to get something. I'm an environment where everyone knows I'm trying to get something. Once you start playing that game that I know that you know that I know that you know, right, and you're starting to play the player, it's not going to end well. It might go well once or twice, but you're then essentially playing double or nothing, and eventually people who play double or nothing end up with nothing. So that's just statistics. That's not an opinion. And so... I, you know, I'm very, very careful with the use of deception. Now, there are moments, emergency moments. I write about them in the book when I catch up with this drug gang leader in Dubai where, y- you know, you really have to figure out your strategy right. and you have to cover what it is that you actually want. And you have to figure out how, how you get that. You can't intimidate him. You can't bribe him. The yeah. only way you can do him is allow him to reveal himself, right, through flattery. Yeah. And even that has to be subtle. If it's too thick, he'll pick up on that. So that's <laughs> so that's the form of deception, essentially, is just allow people to trip themselves up, right? Yeah. That's the best you can do. This is, uh, I, I, I told you uh, in an email, and just I love this book. I love the things that you pick up on. I mean, you approach things in a different way than I would, but that's, that's just always going to be the case. We have common approaches, but the details and your reliance and ability to communicate, just fantastic. Everybody should get it. The book is called Proof of Life, and it's about this um, Daniel on this adventure trying to rescue this. And I'm not going to go into too much about, you know, how the story goes because you should read the book. And it's again, when you read the book, you're going to keep thinking you're reading a fictional thriller, but it's a real story of trying to rescue this kid that's been uh, disappeared in Syria. Um to get people that have disappeared in Syria to meet a drug dealer means that guys like you, guys like me, my, my main job, and I say all the time, like one of the reasons why um, I didn't get a job when I came back from Iraq and, and Afghanistan was that my job was to know warlords, to know the most evil people in that region, because they're the ones planning the nefarious things that we're trying to stop. And so you go and you, you meet someone. I met this guy in Iraq that would laugh about killing women and children for Saddam. Just laugh about it like it was the funniest thing and describe in great detail all these things. Your face has to be, you have to even laugh sometimes with right. these guys because you're trying to identify with someone who is literally the face of pure evil. You can't, like I always say with culture, you don't have to approve of men and young boys having sex in the Middle East, but it is a reality. And so you can't fix that problem right here in this meeting. And you might have to look at something or hear about something and like you may choose to take that thing on, but goodbye mission. I mean, like, now you're taking on a different thing. Right. So when you deal with these people that you know are the face of evil and you have to like, I don't care that you sell women. What I care about is this particular part of my mission and that stuff. I'm not here for that. Yeah. And, and you know, there are little crutches there. First of all, uh, the, the one, the f- first thing you have to figure out in dealing with these kinds of individuals, especially those who have become very powerful and often stupendously wealthy in these wars, like this drug guy who controls like 80 percent or at the time controlled 80 percent of the captagon market in Syria. Uh, these are billionaires. They became billionaires in the war. They may be evil by our standards, but they're sure as hell not dumb. And so the, I think the biggest mistake we make is for a number of reasons, we associate things with each other that have nothing to do with each other and are correlated. So someone who's evil is not dumb. Someone who's rich, not necessarily stupid either, right? So you have to start to think this through and not go into it with judgments. And then there are going to be moments of shock. So in particular, this drug lord, who he, he talks about women and young girls that he's taken away from villages and sold to prostitution as if he was selling vacuum cleaners to him. There's no moral difference between taking a 12-year-old girl and sell, selling her into sex slavery in Dubai uh, than there is between, you know, buying a car or selling a car. To him, it's just a transaction. Uh, and so you have to sit there. But if you're going to be forcibly stoic, you're going to play yourself a little bit. In other words, just to sit there with a poker face, first of all, he's going to view it as dissent, right, or judgment. Uh, on the other hand, you can't really laugh out loud. It's just going to sound too disingenuous if it's too repulsive. So then you start to figure out even words, whether it's in English or in Arabic. For example, you know, you can say Ya Allah in Arabic and it can be 
outrage or it can be admiration or just a surprise, right? It's neutral in that way. Or you can say, you know, if someone does something that you think is wrong, you can say shohada and it sounds sharp, but it can also be kind of funny. Like shohada, you'd say to a kid that's kind of naughty, but really funny at the same time too. So you start to get those crutches. They again buy, buy you time to regain your composure in that moment. But I agree with you that if you, if you over-emotionalize the task, you're not going to do well. Yeah. And that is not, that's not just people in the military or intelligence context. So if you are a pediatric oncologist and you get too close to the family and to the child that, is, that you're treating for cancer, you're just not going to be able to do your job. You really need to compartmentalize it. It may seem cruel. It may seem unempathetic. But if you can't do that, and look, I mean, we served in the army. I was in Israeli special forces. I mean, it's just, if you're not able to do that, then you really shouldn't be doing this kind of work. And it is often uh, a tightrope where there's danger on both sides and you don't know which way to lean because you're not allowed to see what you're doing. You're just kind of doing things in the blind. And again, that kind of takes me back to the whole thing where I just try to be straightforward and honest. You know, sure, I'm a spy by trade. And I'll say to someone, I'm like, yeah, of course I'm here to find things out. And here's the thing is, is my peers will say, oh, no, you're an information collector. You're a human. And they'll have some kind of industry term. And I'm like, yeah, I don't look at it that way. I look at it from their point of view, looking at me. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is the short story. So I, I was tasked by name. My partner was tasked by name to grab me and bring them, bring me and my friend to a Taliban meeting because the Taliban wanted to sort us out. But because we were always true to what we were doing, and I always say, like, look, I'm going to ask questions. If you don't want to answer them, don't. I'm only here to try to understand so I can help get the Americans to do less of what doesn't work and more of what does. And then also help you guys understand what they're trying to do and, and to create. I'm trying to channel the influence. I have no, and you'll, you'll recognize this, I have no resources. I have right. nothing I can offer. I'm just here to offer a smoother communication path. If that's right. useful to you guys. And I'm 100% and I always act that way. And so when the Taliban sees that and they see that we're respected men and we respect Islam and we respect the farmers there, they're like, yeah, those guys are cool. They can hang out in this valley and talk to people. Right. But that that's not a game one kind of skill, Daniel. You don't learn that on you don't, matter of fact, you don't learn that in the Israeli special forces or or in army counterintelligence school. You learn that on floors, drinking chai, eating whatever they make. I mean, that's that's where you learn that stuff. But, you know, partly it's just we're a result of our life and our backgrounds. I mean, I was born in Israel. Then we moved to Kenya when I was a little boy. And so first I spoke Hebrew. Then we spoke English at home. Then I went to Kenya and I spoke Swahili and Kikuyu and Luo. And I was the only white kid in kindergarten. I was in kindergarten with Uhuru Kenyatta, the current president of Kenya, right? So we're like little kids in the 60s there. And you start to adjust. Then you go back to Israel. Then you go back to Switzerland. So I'm like, then it's new language. And so you're constantly figuring out how to adjust. And I think those were, there's pain in that, in the sense that you're constantly, you know, pitching a tent and then pulling it down again and leaving friends behind, not often saying goodbye. By the time I was 10, I'd lived in different continents, different cultures, different language zones, different religions, everything. So you start to adjust and you still have to remember who you are. So you're not Zelig who just, you know, blends into every kind of surrounding. But I think that this you know, this ability that now has helped me professionally, but this willingness also to sort of just mm -hmm. fit in that way where it's authentic because you really are not from any other place. I'm not going there holding an American flag or a Swiss flag or an Israeli flag or anything like that. I'm not representing right. anyone. I'm, I'm pretty clear about what I want. And it's on its face. And whatever I can do to get that, I'm willing to do to get that. But you're not playing anyone anymore that way. And it seems so this mix of fitting in and not overestimating yourself, not a coming in guns. I mean, the most embarrassing meetings are for me, especially when I have official people coming with me, whether they're from an embassy, say hey, people sometimes, yeah. you know, and they come in there and they kind of hit on the table and say, OK, here's. Here's what you have. Here's what we have. Here's how the solution is going to be. And no one leaves this room until we are until we're done. And people look at you like, what are you talking about? Just go away. My dad told me a story about the late Richard Holbrook, where he was negotiating. My dad was in, in the 50s still a diplomat in Cyprus and knew all the players on the Turkish side, on the Cyp Greek Cypriot side really well. And he was a very seasoned diplomat. And uh, he told me Holbrook just marches into a meeting uh, in Cyprus and says, all right, here's what the Turkish side wants. Here's what the Greeks I want. No one's leaving the room until we have this solution. I'm going to broker it. People looked at him and just got up and left. Right. In other words, 
you're really missing the point because it's like an umpire coming to a game thinking 50,000 people are there to watch the umpire. You're right. really just a facilitator. And once you've in, you sort of really internalized that where it's just mm. part of you, I think that part's easy then. I, I don't I don't think that stuff consciously anymore because I really am acutely aware of my lack of leverage and my lack of authority. That uh, that meeting, we've all sat in that meeting. I watched a general walk into this, not just rural, but like rugged, distant district. And he's like, we're going to bring in a mall here. It's all oh, this is going to be rebuilt. And I'm just like embarrassed for the guy because he's so irrelevant in this area. Right. And he's really, he'd never accept it, but he's just left me a pile of work to go back and go, we all know that's not happening. Let's work on the things that we're actually trying to do. Like, how about get people to accept that they have a government and come to it for help and actually provide some help? You know, because the Taliban says there's not going to be a mall. You know, this guy has no idea. But right. he's, one of the things I would always say, and I'm curious what you think about this uh, State Department, whoever's going to be, when I'm going to get to a new unit, I'd see the commander and, and he's like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, you know, I do, I do the things that we do. And, and I'm like, well, what can I, what question can I answer for you? Like, what's one thing I can figure out? And it's just sort of a, I know what he's going to basically say because commanders are commanders. And he basically would say, I need to know who the guy is, who I need to talk to so I can, you know, win. And I'm like, oh, I know that guy. I already know. Him. I don't know who he is. He looks just like you, you know, and the less you're you, the more you can let me go out and not be a colonel, not have a bag of money, not have all the answers, the ability to shut up and listen. Right the better, the more successful you're going to be because you're doing too much. You're too big. You're too you, you know, in places like Afghanistan. I totally agree. This, I've gone through this a million times. By the way, not just in the Middle East. I've been in U.S.-China military meetings where, you know, Secretary of State, you know, literally now, you know, grandstands something about some, whatever it is, something that the U.S. is never going to accept. And then look at him like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, yeah. You're in no position. You're, you're writing checks no one can cash. Right. Like, well, what are you talking about? And so this, this, and I've been to meetings at the Lebanese Syrian border where, you know, people from the U S embassy show up in a bunch of dark SUVs right. and, you know, pull up and I hear the locals talk, right. And I'm hearing mm -hmm. they're laughing. They're just laughing. Okay. Let's go through this theater. Let's play this along. Let's give them a show that they're asking for. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're hearing all this stuff and you just wish it weren't that way. And then I have to be careful because of split loyalties, right? In other words, I can't really sell my side down the river and trash in them. So it's really more you're trying to bridge those gaps and it just made work a little bit harder for you. So, yeah. and look, most of my work kicks in when the official part failed, right? Yeah. So if you're talking about hostages, usually it's not like I'm working tandem side by side. Usually what happens is official ways, official attempts went dark, right? Just lost no chance whatsoever. And then you're trying to pick up the pieces. And, and so so I'm usually working without that. But every once in a while, the moments that you described, you know, you just sit there and think, God, you know, I, I could do without that kind of support. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of uh, so one of really good friends of mine is a guy named Dan White. His brother, you probably remember the story. It was Michael White, the guy that was abducted or held, you know, in prison in Iran. And and someone got him out through intermediaries because the U.S. and Iran can't talk, but you go through Switzerland and you have these kind of conversations. But here's this thing where I don't you don't know why Michael is even there, but he was and he gets arrested and COVID is happening. And, and he is, um, you know, either deathly ill or just over being deathly ill from cancer. And, and I think at one point he had AIDS. That's all this kind of crazy stuff goes on. But someone was the mouthpiece that ultimately got him out. And, and it was like, just shut up and take the out and just go and don't talk about it anymore. You know, and that was kind of the deal. And maybe that was done by the State Department, but I got a feeling that that's probably done through a third party. That is no, no, I'm, I'm a very aware of the case from the Swiss side. And, and that was the State Department did nothing there. This was all the Swiss side that can tell you for a fact. Yeah. I can't talk about it more than that, but sure, sure, sure. yeah, this is, uh, you know, th this was done through uh, relationships that existed despite the official statements that were going on there. The same thing with Levinson's, you know, body that people mm -hmm. were looking for, the guy who disappeared on Quiche Island in Iran. Right. Uh, you know, when the, the problem that you have, and this happens again and again, so if you've sanctioned people, whether it's, you know, terror groups or whether it's governments or government representatives or state-owned enterprise people, once you've sanctioned people, there's very little you can do officially to establish a contact with them. So if you've, if you've sanctioned everyone in the Iranian regime, right? Every, the top 20 layers of the revolutionary guards and the Quds Force and so on, 
And then you want to have a conversation about an American who went missing or even someone that you know has died, but you want the remains to be returned, whatever the case may be. You're done. There's really mm -hmm. nothing left for you to talk about. So then, yeah, you either establish something through the Swiss. Sometimes other countries do a negotiation. But there's nothing any more officially you can do, which kind of brings you back to the value of those sanctions exactly. So, ex you know, what are you going to do that day that you actually do need to have a dialogue? For whatever reason, it can be mm -hmm. hostages, can be a mm -hmm. de-escalation, can be a communication that an escalation wasn't intended. There can be an explosion on a tanker that you never intended or you didn't intend to escalate and you make sure that's communicated, but you're no longer communicating with anyone directly. So, uh, you know, I, I think that if you want to be effective in this kind of work, you should do a whole lot less of these public declarations, even state department, because there's really nothing to be gained. And the thing to figure out, and you learn it's the hard way with hostage negotiations, all those public statements that then mm -hmm. got put on social media, right? Because state department, God forbid, also shouldn't do Instagram and Facebook and Twitter <laughs> and everything else. Right. All that does is it's all done for domestic audience. It's all done for domestic politics and re-elections and so on and so on. But in, in terms of getting something done, so you have an American who's taken hostage in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in, in Central America, wherever it is. When you're doing those things, you just made it exponentially harder because the two things happen. One, you pissed off the people who are holding the person. You just are going to piss them off because you're yeah. going to call them something. And number two, you just increase the price. Because by doing this officially, you're creating the impression that this person is a high value asset that they're holding. Otherwise, why would a secretary of state, why would a national security advisor, why would a president, a vice president or a congressman, why would they be taking such an interest to tweet and to do pub press conferences? They're only doing that because this mm -hmm. must be a high value person, maybe a CIA person. Right. And so you just made the job of the negotiators that, that much harder. The first thing I do. In any hostage negotiation, when I'm asked this, I tell everyone, shut up. Yeah. Just shut up. Go dark. Shut up. The family, you want to do print T-shirts and bumper stickers, knock yourself out. Public statements, stop talking. Government, mm -hmm. stop talking. Spiha, you know, the special envoy for hostage negotiations in the State Department, shut up. And if they can't do that, I usually step back and say, I'm out. I can't do yeah. that. Yeah. No, you're right, because they're going to create more problems than you can account for, and, and, and you can't fix that. It's it's uh, The book is fantastic. It's called Proof of Life. It's about this crazy story where Daniel goes and tries to help a friend of a friend. And, and, you know, you end up meeting all these people. And again, it's when you read it, you're going to think I'm reading a, like a fiction book. That's how crazy this is. You guys, you guys got to check this thing out. There are so many things I want to ask you about uh, with your day to day stuff, because it, it is fascinating. One of the things that's pretty neat when you read the book, um, when you read about Daniel, like he yeah, he's multilingual. And he knows these people that are high, high players in the Middle East. And, and he's, it's international entry. But in real life, when you – this isn't the only time you've done this kind of thing. So are there more books in the hopper that you're going to do? I don't know yet. You know, I wrote a, an earlier book called Nothing But a Circus, which was kind of looking back in individual mm -hmm. stories of my life in different parts of China, Russia, and other parts of the world, the kind of work I did in – in, in in Russia in the early 2000s and mm -hmm. er, Putin's for early years. So uh, in terms of hostage negotiations, I'm not sure. I really wrote this book because of a promise I made to two young girls who we managed to get out of there. This is not a spoiler because it's not about the hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, two young girls who have been taken from a village in Syria and we managed to get them out of Dubai and get them into Western Europe and they live now with new identities. They're, you know, the younger of the two is my daughter's age. My daughter's just turning 23 in a few weeks. So, um, so, so they're very much in my life and they asked me, they helped me actually get the information I was looking for. And in return, they asked me to tell the story. It was the main reason I actually wrote the book. Most of the work that I do is really in the dark in this. I don't talk about hostage negotiations and certainly don't talk about hostages. Um, it was important for me to tell this story so that the gap between how people perceive these kinds of wars and hostage situations and what the reality is on the ground, uh, that people start to get a little bit of a sense of that stuff. If I'm going to write another book on this, it's going to be the story of these two girls. Okay. And I'm going to write it with them. So that's going to be the next thing I write about. From being taken as young girls, 12 and 14 years old, from a village in Syria, sold into sex slavery, and then escaping that life and starting their new lives. I'm going to write that with them, that story. Because we're now working on the screenplay for the book. And there will be some interfacing with their story if they continue to agree to be part of it. So that that's kind of what I'm thinking in that respect.
There's so much wisdom in the book and you, you hear all these things that people say to you when you write them down. It's wonderful. Like the, the one of them, you know, I've got like my book of woe because you hear all these horrible stories and, and I want to do a quite quick aside here. When you talk about the atrocities that happen, I mean, you know, humans are so bad at humanity. I think it's one of the first things you say, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing what you say, but just there's so many horrible things and you see the damage of war and conflict and people that are left behind. We talk about PTSD here and how hard it is for veterans. Imagine what it's like to live there mm -hmm. and to not just go home and suffer, but to constantly be there, constantly lose people, not believe you have a chance to do anything. All of these things get shoved into your book of woe. And uh, one of your friends says to you, you know, when you stand on nails, you want to have there be a bed of nails instead of a single nail. One of the best things, there's two, two great things I learned along the way that are, that are bits of wisdom that I picked up is I had this general who ran a division and he said, it's like, I know everything except for what's happening on the ground. If you can bring me the ground truth, then I know like how to better, you don't need to give me the solution. I'll figure that part out. But what I don't know is, you know, I can't go there and do what you do. I need more of that. And the other thing was uh, an Afghan uh, government leader. And he asked me this crucial question that I was able to bring back to the Americans that had made him completely change the, their mindset. Because remember, we're there to, to, to teach and train and enable this fledgling government. And he says, there's only room for one sword in the scabbard. Mm -hmm. So who's the sword? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, got it. Got it. You know, and and it changed everything about what we did in that region, because this guy was like, I'm the damn sword. Get the hell out of the way. You know, you can be a scabbard. You can be the leather lash that holds the scabbard to my belt. But only you'd only be one sword. What are some of the things that you've picked up along the way that are like that? I mean, you can't stand on one nail and there are so many nails that you could stand on individually. But at some point you're going to just recover a body or you're just going to recover a picture of what used to be a body. And that's going to be the answer. It's not all good news. Yeah. I think that uh, for me, a big, uh, a big lesson. I mean, there's this one gentleman in the book whose the real name is Khalid al Uh Khalid is kind of like a mentor, an unbelievable friend. And, and I'll tell you, there are three Americans alive today, reporters alive today, thanks to this guy uh, mm -hmm. who, who got one out of Yemen, two out of Syria. Uh, just an unbelievable person, never took credit for it, extremely wise. He's the one who tells me in the book, you know, don't be that barking dog, right? You're looking <laughs> for information. Make sure that you know what you do when you catch up with the car. Don't just keep on barking. You better have a plan, like, you know, plan your work, then work your plan. So he, he talks that way. But the thing that he always reminded me of, I didn't put in the book because it's always so something between him and, and me, is he'd always say, you know, if I, if I messed up, I wasn't properly prepared for something, or if he was a little disappointed with my focus, He'd always grab me by the chin and say, you want to have a seat at the table or you want to be on the menu? Mm -hmm. And, and he always, you know, it was that it was stuck with me that, that kind of work. Like that, it, there are two kinds. It's okay. It's perfectly okay to be on the menu, but you have to understand you're not going to have a seat at the table then. And so, you know, you go through these stories and it is, I don't want to over dramatize these things, these searches for hostages and searches for information about hostages because it's really step by step by step. And it's yeah. really, it's very granular work. You know that from your own experience, like people have these romanticized visions that you, you know, parachute in and it's some, some grand thing. It's silly. It is so granular and it's yeah. grunty work. It's really hard work. And it's, and you really have to be willing to put in those hours. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no shortcuts, but at the end, it, it's keeping yourself grounded that way. Like don't overplay your hand, right? But remember that the, remember you make a mistake, you go to the other side of the tracks. You now are on the menu. You no longer have a seat at the table. So those are that that's the kind of wisdom that for me. And then you have the night, the night that I spent with the head, the guy called the Sheikh in the book, that he was the head of a powerful militia in South Beirut. So anyone who reads the footnotes will know who I'm talking about there. Someone sanctioned by the US. It's a night I'll never forget because he, this is this militia, this powerful religious leader who starts challenging me on religion, on the symbol of the eagle, on, on uh, you know, assimilation in the U.S., on civil rights movement in the U.S. And I was not prepared for that. You know, it, it felt like someone's holding my head underwater. That's what it felt like really in that time. So uh, you're never quite prepared for all those moments. Mm -hmm. The more authentic you are and you sort of remember your core principles, it's almost like muscle memory then kicks in into, the, into that. And that's yeah. the only way to go through this. When you, yeah, when you're looking for someone evil and you catch them, um, you better be ready. I mean, you yeah. need to have, I know like as soon as I walk off the camp, I've got my little system and boundaries and mindsets that I put myself in. And I'm, I'm the happiest guy as long as you're outside of that bubble. But once you cross into the bubble, 
I take different decisive action. There was one point in the book where I'm like, Daniel should just get up and leave right now and force this guy to call him back, right? And it's easy for me to say that sitting in my armchair reading a book, you know, but you're there in the moment. And actually that guy gets up and spins on you and walks away, you know, and it's like, oh, and, and you made that decision in that moment. And you might've made the better decision than I might've made, but but you knew that someone had to get up at that point because yep. you were reaching the conclusion and somebody had to put a period on that meeting. Uh, it doesn't mean it's the last meeting, but you know, all of these things, this granular stuff you're talking about, by the way, constantly exhausted. I get it. I heard it in the book. You're like, I was so tired. Right. That was, you know, because you have, this is for the audience more than anything else. We're traveling, we're prepping, we're processing, we're meeting, we're, 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 we're and it never stops. So a 30 hour day, that's normal. Right. I mean, because you go until you go because the pace is slow, but when the pace is fast, you can't relent. You have to stay up and, and go through it. It's uh, it's a remarkable, remarkable book and remarkable tale. And I just uh, I'm so glad you told this story because we way underestimate how hard it is to survive in Syria, even to this day, how there are slaves being. We talk about slavery and then the 400 years. There's actual slaves being sold right now, today in this on this planet. And we don't seem to give two shits about that. Like we're yeah. desperate to tear ourselves apart. But it's really happening in Syria and in Libya and these other areas. Absolutely. I mean, we, our foundation's active in Libya, and so I'm very involved there. And so it's really interesting to see that European countries lose their minds because you have a few migrants come across boats across the Mediterranean to Italy or Spain. Uh, but the fact that you have an active slave market in 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 Benghazi, in Sirte, in Tripoli, mm -hmm. in 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 a lot of the northern coastal cities in Libya, an active slave market with people from Niger from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa traveling through there are being sold. Uh, it's not something that particularly phases us. And I'm not trying to be a moralist about it. It's not that. It's just that I think we at least need to be informed. At least to be informed. It's okay to say, well, I'm going to base my foreign policy based on our domestic interests. You can be honest about sort of the Kissinger approach. I have no problem with that. Just be honest about it. Save us all the virtue talk. That's the only thing I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And don't make our job any harder than it has to right. <laughs> totally. do these things. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's an incredible thing. What's what what part of it are you most proud of the book? Not, not the story, but just like because you've done something pretty incredible. Uh, look, I think the most proud I am of getting the two girls out and, and giving him a chance of a new life. It doesn't it's meaningless in a cosmic sense. I get that just like I'm meaningless in a cosmic sense, whether I exist or don't exist doesn't make a difference. It makes a mi minor difference to people in my immediate family for a short period of time. But in terms of finding purpose and finding a certain meaning, why we're doing it, why are we sacrificing, why are we going through all that, being able to affect two people's lives who whose lives probably would have ended pretty soon otherwise. Mm -hmm. Uh, and give them that and have them be in your life and give you back so much more than you were able, ever able to be. Even. It's what, really what I'm the most proud of, I, I will say. And nothing to do with a book or whether it becomes a movie, any of the other stuff. It's sort of where you look back and say, okay, there was a lot of hardship. I made a lot of mistakes, but that was really worth it. And, and so those are those moments. And I do feel blessed. And that's true for any hostage negotiation. It's obviously many end terribly. Many hostages get executed many times. You're not able to succeed. You can't even get proof of life in some cases. There are hostages in Syria that have been there since before the Arab Spring started 10 years ago, but it's certainly since the Spring started, the hostages have been there for 10, 8, 9, 7 years. No one is probably ever going to hear of them again. They're heartbreaking stories. Sometimes we can just bring closure to the family. It is a certain, it's a purpose. And, and I'm, I feel blessed when I can do something of that like that. It's just a short moment in my life. You know, the, you know it. We know what it's like yeah. when you're serving. There's a different sense of purpose than just sort of going to the grind. And sometimes it's hard to adjust to civilian life afterwards. Because without that purpose, the sacrifice becomes a little bit hard. Yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> it's, it's, when you have that kind of impact on something, and then all of a sudden, like, and for me, largely, I've been unemployable since I've come back. And, and they're like, well, what do you, you can go guard something. And I'm like, you don't understand how, right. you know, how hard it is to go work in this highly complex, highly dangerous environment. And, you know, and, and, and I know you'll appreciate this. Like, I, I'm good enough at my job that I'm getting introduced to people that no one else even knows. Right. You know, and I'm meeting these, these elders and, and then you come back and uh, you're not even employable. I mean, come, it's like, Oh, come on. You, you're, you know, this is uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, just again, thanks. Thanks for coming on and talking about this. Thanks for writing the book. I always Thank talk you, about the, um, the superhero part, like, like 
it will sound like you're a superhero. But the reality is, and I bet this is true for you, if you were to watch me work on a day-to-day basis, you'd think he's just fooling around, talking right. to people and having lunches and stuff. Right. But the whole time, my brain's just spinning and I'm working exceptionally hard and it's just absolutely using up a lot of energy to do these things right. And so I know what you do. I see it and I get it. And I try my best to tell these kind of stories so people can understand just how improbable it is. And there are so many times in the world where if not for you in that place in that time with your skill set, it would be nobody ever. It just, it's a one in a hundred chance that you get those girls out or one in a million. Even. You know, I appreciate that. Thing. Right I, person, I, right time. Yeah. I really appreciate it. God bless you. And you know, and thanks for you, what you do, because you have to be willing to do it. That's sort of by definition away from microphones, away from cameras. And so there's no parade when you come home and, and that that's okay. But it, it is, uh, there are moments where you're sort of in your own reality and you're walking around with people around you thinking, God, you guys have no idea. You just don't understand. Uh, and that's just, that's okay. It's part of the deal. It's part of the deal. Yeah, we stand up for that. Right.